uh, today we are going to learn a little bit about what the earth and climate science is, especially focusing on the animal kingdom and how do we know anything about them when they are not around. So if you think about earth and climate science, um, we have a general interest about the things that are happening around us in the earth and climate and we try to understand it using principles of physics, chemistry, mathematics, biology and looking at observational patterns in the field and around us. So it is quite different in some cases when it comes to experiments. Think about a classical experiment that you would like to do in let's say biology. Let's say your question is that how or whether a bacterial colony changes or grows uh, depending on light. Let's say it's a silly question but still let's say that's your question. How do you go about it? You probably develop an experimental setup and you keep some petri dishes, you try to grow the bacterial colony and you expose them at different intensity of light because you are interested whether changing the light intensity actually changes the growth of the bacteria. And so you are changing the initial condition of the experiment and you are trying to understand what is the outcome and how the outcome is changing. Now in earth and climate sciences our questions often involve things that happened over millions of time, years. And it is not possible to do an experiment involving that time. For example, let's say many of us are curious to know how the Himalayas formed. And let's say my question is very specifically if I want to know whether two tectonic plates collided and formed the Himalayas over a few million years. Now how do we approach it? It is not really possible to change the initial condition and finally see what is the outcome because there is no experimental facility at this point where we can really generate the Himalayas of the same scale. Instead what we try to do, we try to break the question into smaller component. We first start with the field observation, we first start with the Himalayas and try to understand how did it form, what are the patterns that we are observing and then we try to make smaller questions of smaller scales that we can do in the experimental facility but a big challenge is to bridge the gap between the experimental scale and finally what is the observational pattern. So in, in some ways uh, it is slightly different and that's why it's so much fun to actually break a big question into smaller component, design the experiments. But at the same time, if you ask me to perform an experiment today here, it is going to be difficult because as I said, that the scales are very different, both the time and the spatial scale, and it is not really easy to do it right here. So I will try to give you a general sense of a particular topic of earth and climate science which I find fascinating and uh, hopefully by the end of session you will appreciate uh, some of the aspects of how we do research or how we try to understand a question. So my field of focus is paleontology which basically means the study of ancient organisms. Paleo means old. Uh, and the rest basically means study of organisms and the first thing where we start from are the fossils. Although you might not be familiar with this term called paleontology or fossils, um, I'm sure that you have seen enough things that are relevant to this discussion. So let us go to the first slide and let me show you a few pictures, okay? Now if you look at these pictures, I'm sure 
that you have seen these pictures before. And these pictures are taken from popular films. Um, if you see in the left hand panel, you see this is a shot from the movie Ice Age. It's a cartoon film. If you look at the right hand panel at the top, you see a clip from uh, Jurassic Park, the latest version. And at the bottom, you see another uh, movie clip from the recent movie called Meg. So these are all part of popular culture. Many of you have seen these movies. Many of you have probably looked at some of the clippings of these movies. Have you ever thought that what, is, what else is common among these three pictures? So let me give you a few seconds for you to figure out. Yes, you are correct. None of these animals exist today. None of them you see around living and walking and moving. All of them are extinct, what means that they died long back ago and we do not really have them around. Now my next question is, then how do we know anything about them? How do we know that whether this woolly mammoth actually walked on the earth? How did we know that these uh, dinosaurs uh, actually walked on the earth, killed animals and they were so big? How did we know these big sharks, the megalodons, um, were living in the sea? So this brings us to the question of fossils because all of these information comes from the fossil record. Okay? So in next couple of minutes, we are going to talk something about the fossils and how do we know what we know and how much of it is imagination that goes into the movies. So to start with, fossils by the, just the term fossils, uh, it basically means something that's dug up. In fact, historically, people did not really know what fossils were and they simply called anything that was dug up uh, a fossil. But later, uh, people realized that we should have a proper definition and by that uh, time, people uh, finally made the definition as the remnant of any animal or their activity, any organism or their activity, as long as it's recorded uh, in the rock, we are calling them fossils. Now, the next question is, how do you get a fossil? So let us take a quick look at a picture. Okay, This is a classic fish fossil. Okay. Now, if you take a look at this fish fossil, what you will find that it has a skeleton and it has some dark material inside and the rest of the light colored materials is actually the rock. Now, take back this idea a little bit more and think about it just for a second that we are talking about a living organism, a living creature, a swimming fish. How do you get to make it trapped in a rock? Rock is a solid thing, right? And that is one question which people wondered about for a very long time. They could see that there is a solid fish impression and they could also see that it's actually part of a solid rock. How do you ensure that a solid gets trapped inside another solid? It's a very simple question, but it bothered people for a very, very long time. So to start with, a very old paleontologist, although they were not called paleontologists, they were primarily called uh, naturalists at that point, he started to think about this problem and he came up with this idea that at some point of time, the rock that we are seeing today must have been in a situation where it was not solid. It must have turned solid at a later stage. And that's the only way it can go and take the remnant of the fish and eventually solidify. 
So that was the first step of understanding how the uh, fossils are made. Now we know that fossils are primarily found in a specific type of rock which is called a sedimentary rock. Now if you look at this particular slide, you will see at the very left there is this uh, river which is flowing and it's depositing its sediments. These are clay, sand and a fish is swimming. In the next panel you are seeing that that particular fish died and it's covered by mud and it's buried. In the final panel at the very right you are finding that the fish sort of looks like a fossil. So in, in very simple words that if you have a live animal, you bury it and then cover it with sediments. Then with time, if the sediments becomes really hard, and by the way, the sediments becomes harder if it gets pressed, if it suffers through high temperature, pressure, then the space between the sediments decreases and it becomes really, really hard. It no longer becomes mushy like a mud, rather, it connects to each of these particles and eventually becomes very, very hard, what we call a rock. But the important part of it is the animal after its death should survive for some time before it goes into this rock building process. How does it happen? It's not so simple. Let's take a thought experiment, okay? Let's look around. I'm sure wherever you are sitting or standing, uh, you can see some creatures around, okay? Maybe you can see a house lizard or maybe there is a fish in your aquarium. And let's take a moment to think what happens if unfortunately one of these die. So let's take the example of the fish. So when the fish in your aquarium dies, in the first couple of days, you will see that the soft tissues rot. That means they are being attacked by the bacteria and eventually it will all fall off and you will probably see the skeleton, bare skeleton. And uh, then if you keep it there, even though it will stink really bad, if you keep it there for some time, you will find that even the skeletons are disintegrating and if you keep it there for very, very long time, let's say a couple of years, probably you will see that there is absolutely nothing. It's all mixed with the sediments if your uh, aquarium actually has some sand at the bottom and you don't really find anything. Now the question is, um, is it going to be different if you look at the house lizard? Well, probably no. You are still going to see the same thing that initially it's getting eaten by ants, then it's getting disintegrated, it starts to rot and eventually you will find the skeletons. Even the skeletons do not survive for very, very long. Uh, finally, you will probably not find anything that is recognizable as part of the house lizard. Okay? So if this is the common thing, then how come we do find fossils or remnants of old life. How do they escape this initial part where they are being attacked by bacteria or other kinds of scavengers? So somehow they need to be get preserved in the very early phase before they are covered by sediments and they finally get into the rock building process. And we are going to think some of the ways where you can really think about how to preserve things, okay? So let us think, start to think, it's the kitchen. In kitchen, we do use different techniques to preserve things, okay? If you bring, uh, let's say, a, a few carrots, and if you keep it aside, uh, probably it's going to rot. But if you see the pickle, where the carrots are still there, it might be surviving there for a couple of years and you are still enjoying it. So there are very simple things that we do to preserve uh, organic 
materials uh, which are quite stunning. So let's start with some of those. So the first thing that we are going to talk about is the refrigeration. Many of you have a fridge at your house and uh, it's a place where we keep our food. Sometimes when we are hungry at night we even try to go there and grab some things. But the main utility of the fridge is to keep it for some time. And how does it happen? The primary thing is its temperature. It's cold. When you make something cold, many of the bacteria, they cannot grow properly. And as a result, the initial bacterial hunt doesn't happen. Okay? And that's one of the ways of preserving things. And that's one of the ways where nature preserves things. Okay? So let us take a look at a picture which you might have seen before. Uh, some of you might not have seen. And this is a fantastic example of a natural refrigeration. The picture that you see is a woolly mammoth cuff. Okay? It's a baby woolly mammoth. And the name of this woolly mammoth is Luba. Okay? It was found from Russia. Now unlike the first picture that I showed you um, of Ice Age where you have seen a cartoon of a woolly mammoth, this picture is not photoshopped. This picture has not been changed in any way. The person at the right hand side, she is a living kid and she is touching this Luba which is obviously dead. but Luba lived 41,000 years ago. So this kid is actually touching a fossil which is very, very old. How did it happen? So as I said that Luba was found from Russia and um, I was quite ecstatic about using this picture because it brings me back me memories. When I was in my PhD and uh, I was a student, uh, this expedition was going on and one of our former professor was involved in this expedition. So we used to hear a lot of uh, interesting anecdotes of this expedition that how did they find Luba and uh, what was so interesting about Luba. So to give you a quick peek into Luba, uh, Luba was found from Russia as I said and she was preserved in ice Initially, uh, she was covered with a mud blanket and then trapped in ice. How did it happen in nature? Luba, along with many other mammoths, they were crossing a river and they were trapped because the river had mud at the bottom and she was trapped inside. Eventually, she was completely covered by mud and because of the changes in the temperature, the uh, river was frozen and Luba got trapped in this frozen part of the river which never melted. As a result, it's like a permanent refrigeration for 41,000 years. And it's not very specific to Luba uh, because there are Siberian mammoths and mastodons which have been found like this even in other spots. So Preservation by refrigeration, by natural refrigeration, is quite common when it comes to animals which lived in subarctic regions. Just to give you some more interesting facts about Luba, uh, if we can go back to this picture. Luba was a tiny baby mammoth. Uh, it was 35 days old and the age of the mammoth, uh, how old she was in terms of her own age, uh, can be deciphered by the teeth. Okay? Uh, you can go through the development of tooth and you can come up with a pretty good estimate of how old the fossils are in terms of their own age. How old are they in terms of our time scale, like 41,000 years old? That comes from the fact that you can really date the surrounding regions. Uh, by uh, radiocarbon method in this case and come up with a good age estimate. Now when people dissected Luba, they found that in its gut there was still milk 
undigested milk and some feces or poop. And it's quite common among elephants to digest poop because that helps them to grow bacterial colony in their gut which helps them to digest other kinds of food especially when they are babies. Okay? So all of these information comes from studying Luba, this one fossil where it's preserved to the point where all these tiny details are preserved in there. And if you look closely at its ears, you will see that part of the ear is not preserved. It's actually chewed off by dogs before it was reported. So the dogs did not really find, did not find it, I mean, you know, problematic to chew on a 41,000 year old meat. But that's the extent of preservation. Now coming back, uh, what else do we do? in terms of preservation apart from refrigeration. Another technique that we use is when we keep things in a plastic bag and then take out the uh, air out of it, it's generally called shrink wrap. This is another way of preserving things and it can survive for quite long. Um, a close approximation would be if you keep things in a very tightly sealed pack. Uh, let's say a bag of chips, often it can survive quite long compared to if you just keep it outside. And these natural shrink wrap are places uh, or processes where animals can be trapped inside a very thin layer of glue which doesn't allow any air to go inside. Let's take a look at this slide. This is called an amber preservation. I'm sure that you have seen a picture like this in the first Jurassic Park movie where um, an, a mosquito was trapped inside tree sap and these tree saps have very uh, light thin constitution so it covers the entire uh, insect. Eventually it dries up. So it doesn't allow any air to go inside. So the organism, in this case the insect, lives there forever. Extracting DNA from it, that is the part of the imagination. Uh, we are still not there yet. The DNA degrades very quickly. So it is not possible at this point. But the insect gets preserved really well in this amber. So this is the natural shrink wrap. In fact, most of the insect history that we know comes from these kind of amber preservation. The final one I'm going to talk about, which constitutes this entire class of fossils where, which we called a body fossil or unaltered remain, where you can actually find the soft tissue also, is pickling. So in your uh, kitchen, when you go for pickling, what do you do? You play with extreme conditions. Either you increase the salt content very much uh, so that uh, again bacterial colony cannot survive or you play with the pH, make it extremely acidic or you put a lot of oil that makes it survive for very long. Again, you don't allow any kind of bacterial growth or even if the bacterial growth is there, it's not basically making the things rot. It can contribute in some other ways. Now, this is one example that we are going to see in a few minutes, which actually shows the natural pickling. Okay? So again, I'll go to this idea of what do we do in pickling. We ensure that there is no bacterial growth okay? or we are exhausting everything that's there. This particular fossil, it's called Ida. Okay? It's 47 million year old. It is one fossil which represents a primate. Primates are very uh, small mammal organisms. We are primates and primates are almost defined by the character that we have opposable thumbs. Our thumbs are going uh, on the other side of our fingers. So that's sort of a definition of primates. And Ida 
is one of the early primates. If you look closely, you will even see some of the hair uh, which is smudged around the edges. And Ida was found uh, in a place in Germany in a lake sediment. And this lake had a volcanic event uh, which basically contributed to the formation of the lake. But because of the high temperature in the initial phase was oxygen level was quite low and whatever oxygen was there was consumed by the initial part where the uh, leaves fell into it and got rotted it all took up the oxygen so the bottom part of the lake got quite anoxic that means there are not much oxygen available there so there were not many living things that were there so after this tiny primate died it uh, fell down and it went into this lake and got deposited at the very bottom of the lake. There are no oxygen, so it did not start to rot. Eventually, it was covered by tiny sediments. Uh, some of them even had uh, qualities which make them very tightly bonded. So there is no way the oxygen can go inside or even any air can go inside and got trapped. So it's almost like a cast, but you are making sure that even the soft parts are there and it's not changing. Eventually, uh, the lake dried up, all the sediments got buried and finally it became a rock. And you have uh, the preservation of this tiny little organism with everything present, starting from its fingers to the tip of the tailbone. Everything is preserved including the uh, hair on its uh, body. So as I said that um, you know it's difficult to find development of fossils today but because earth actually has a long history although it's rare we do find a number of fossils in various cases and as I said that the development of fossils are a rare incident but uh, even the natural senses or natural events can lead to the formation of uh, fossils. Now I will show uh, some of the fossils which are relatively more common where we do not find the soft body but we do find a uh, different kind of preservation. So if we go to the next slide, we will show that this is a cast uh, and mold. So this is when the uh, imprints of hard skeleton uh, gets on the surface of the soft sediments and they leave an impression of the hard body. Okay. These are very common and in fact uh, often we prefer these over the very delicate preservation of fossils simply because we can find a lot of them in terms of its number. Now the next one is a different kind of an impression. This is where the minerals go inside the pore spaces of a tissue. In this case, I am sitting on a tree trunk uh, which is now have become a rock. So all the fine tissues have been replaced by silica. It's common sand but it has been precipitated out of uh, a silica solution. It happens near the volcanoes but again uh, it's a natural preservation and the picture that you see at the right uh, shows that all kinds of tree trunks which are around, all of them have been petrified. Going to the next slide is an example of carbonization. So if we quickly take a look at the table now uh, and coming back from the slides, if we look at the table, I have some example of the carbonized fossil. So if you follow the arrowed uh, area, you can actually see impression of some plant material right over there. 
and here. So it's something like the formation of coal but not quite, it happens relatively in lower temperature where the carbon gets concentrated retaining the shape of uh, various uh, animals that are trapped. But the other kind of fossil that is often found uh, is the trace fossil where you do not really find the animal or the impression of the animal. What you find is something about their activity that there is a footprint which shows the impression but it actually shows that how the animal moved. There are other trace fossils also. The person is standing next to a large burrow, something like uh, the burrow that I am holding in my hand. This is a burrow that we made by putting the wax in, um, in a crab uh, hole. But the same kind of thing you can also find in fossils. Okay, where the sediments filled the holes which animals made and then eventually gets uh, lithified. So these also tell us that exactly how the animals lived. The picture that you see a snail with a tiny hole, it is not the fossil of the snail that we are interested in but what we see is something where the tiny hole is created by another snail to eat this snail. So it shows you something about their activity, how they hunt. Okay? Now I will quickly, very quickly show you a few fossils that I have on this table and probably you can recognize uh, that many of them uh, have these impression. In this case, this is a cast. So you do have the fossil along with its original structure okay and if you follow this one this is also another fossil uh, with very fine preservation these all are fossils of uh, things like this seashells that you find today but we are talking about the age which is uh, in the tune of 25 million years. So this particular rock we found from Gujarat and it tells you a 25 million year old sea floor. Exactly how did, we, how did it look like with all the seashells and other kinds of animals. Okay?